Hello, this is Brad Rederson, and welcome to Spernova's Interview Series, an audio program exploring the intersection between cutting-edge business strategies and the innovations that can ignite business growth. It's one of several podcast series on the subject of strategic innovation in business offered by Stranova, a resource group dedicated to helping you achieve and capitalize on the incredible potential available for your own business. With our over 30 years of experience leading innovation, we know what it takes to turn ideas into profits. Please visit us to learn more at www.stranova.com. And now, please join us for this week's episode of Stranova's interview series. Over 50 years ago, Aldous Huxley, the famous author of Brave New World and many other brilliant works of fiction and nonfiction, published what was to become, for me at least, a pivotal essay entitled Knowledge and Understanding. The issue Huxley was addressing in that essay was one many of us can identify with today. Our obsession with raw knowledge, bits of data we collect without either context or further contemplation to make even common sense of it and the difference between that data harvesting and any true depth of understanding of a subject. Disembodied data without filtering, some organization, and interconnection with other thoughts isn't really worth much. In spite of that warning, echoed and amplified by many others since Huxley's essay first appeared, we have now entered the 21st century in an era where pure information is available everywhere, so much so that we often complain about being in overload because of it. Further, perhaps in an attempt to claim some mastery over the rapidly growing pile of information we're building, we have built educational systems and business organizational models which encourage and reward the development of specialists in every discipline imaginable. There are lawyers who focus solely on copyright law related to multimedia file sharing on the Internet, medical research scientists who focus on a single cellular function all their lives, and marketing experts focusing full-time on the sales implications of toothpaste color choice. The problem with all this specialization and the preoccupation with the mastery of raw knowledge is that we are losing the ability for true strategic innovation that comes from understanding the interconnections between all that information, both for business as well as for life in general. So how do we address the issue of a world obsessed with compartmentalization of data? One approach is to find a new way to explore knowledge that emphasizes interdependence instead of isolation and make that means of exploring readily available to all. And a second approach is to challenge the way we value specialization at the expense of the cross-dimensional insights true and brilliant generalists can offer us for all walks of life. To address these issues this week, we are very pleased to have one of the true great modern thinkers on the subject of the interconnection of all processes and things, James Burke, the world-renowned science historian and author of Connections, both in book form and the related 10-part BBC documentary series, The Day the Universe Changed, and Twin Tracks, among others. Even more importantly for this particular episode of Stranova, Mr. Burke is also the creator of what has become known as the Knowledge Web Project. This effort, perhaps Mr. Burke's most ambitious effort to date, links the power of the Internet to leverage information and harvest data on a grand scale with Mr. Burke's unique vision of enabling interconnecting deep learning and, with it, an even more powerful understanding of the people we are and the world we live in. We spoke with Mr. Burke at his offices in the United Kingdom. James, welcome to Stranova. Thank you very much. It's very exciting to be on this entirely new medium, I must say. I'm very impressed by the way it works. For us to start this conversation, probably as good a place as any is with your Knowledge Web project. Could you tell us a little bit about what it is and what your aims are in bringing it to reality? The Knowledge Web is a knowledge map. It's an interactive, it intended to go online and be used by anyone who wants to use it for nothing, that is to say free. In its present first version, the aim is to have an interactive set of nodes, each one of which is either a person or a thing, from the history of the arts and the sciences, about equally mixed. 
And at the moment, there are just over 2,500 of these nodes. And they are linked with each other in the way that people tend to be linked with one another. A person is linked to others by the fact that they work with them, or they live with them, or they're influenced by them, or they influenced them, or they fought them, or they killed them, or they robbed them, or whatever the link is. And in this way, most of the people on this web are linked somewhere between 10, if you're a nobody, and 40 or 50 if you're a Newton, or Michelangelo. And so the number of total internal links is about 30,000, which means that if you have the facility for hopping, as it were, from one person to another, to another, to another, choosing it as you go along, which particular link interests you or intrigues you, and I hope most of them will, because I tried to find links that were not the usual straight line links, then I suppose it's presumptuous to say this, but I'd like to believe that the number of possible ways you could go through this web is, and I'm no good at combinatorial math, but it involves 2,500 times 30,000 times 29,999 or something like that. In other words, a fairly large number of potential different pathways. And the reason this is of value as far as I'm concerned is because what I'm aiming for really is to provide the individual in the classroom, teacher or student, to have more ways of taking individual pathways through history than will be exhausted in the period which they're doing it, that particular course or that particular study year. And with that many potential pathways, I think that's probably likely. And that's just the first stage. Clearly, what the web also does, obviously, it, it, it provides an interface which allows you to get into the web either in standard ways like find me a person by name or find me a person by when they lived or where they lived or the subject they were in or the sub-discipline they were in or find me a person who was involved in this kind of link or in this kind of activity or find me a person that and then you fill in the blank I mean killed, shot, or married, loved, blah 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 or you can choose things like mystery routes if you're a kid. You can say, take me on a mystery route that links one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence with a Liberty ship in 1944. And then you will be guided through those pathways. Or you can simply dive in and see where you end up. Or you can do things like see if you can find your way to Newton from the modern world. Now, you know, one kind of intelligence in the classroom will say, well, I'll begin with E equals MC squared, and another kind of intelligence will say, I wonder if I can get to Newton from ice cream. So what I'm hoping to do with this is to encourage what I suppose a big fancy word would be a creative approach to learning and using the materials. What else could I say about it? Tell me. Actually, one thing that was kind of funny that had occurred to me is when listening to your description of the various journeys, there's certainly something that here in the States has been fun in past years, which was the six degrees of separation concept. And effectively, one of the things that you actually could do is by putting in one topic and another topic, really showing the essential linkages between all knowledge. Yes. I mean, I have been a little miffed in recent years to have people ask me if I got the idea from Kevin Bacon. <laughs> and in fact, I started this work about 30 years ago. And I'm interested in, you know, many more than six degrees of separation. But because, I mean, if you go from one end of knowledge to the other, sometimes it takes more than six jumps. And after all, I think he was only talking about Hollywood. But basically the aim, as you say, the aim is to show, and I think it's a very important underlying concept, that everything is linked to everything else. And maybe even more important, everybody is linked in some way, however distantly, to somebody else. I mean, if we sat down with this kind of structure, and put in you and me and any one of the people listening to this, I guarantee that in fewer than 20 jumps, there would be a linkage among all three of us. So six degrees is probably a modest way of describing it. Maybe 20 would be closer. That's true. And, and actually, to your credit here, so that people are trying to wonder whether or not it came from Kevin Bacon, Kevin Bacon didn't have a Hollywood film career 30 years ago, so you had to be <laughs> doing it before him. <laughs> But one thing that you also mentioned was the whole issue of using this in the so-called formal educational process. I'm curious, in that respect, do you see this as something that would be actively used in regular education? Boy, that's opening Pandora's box, that question. Y yes, in spades. I mean, 
where should I start? The problem, it seems to me, with modern education is that it's 17th century education, still alive and kicking too much. Perhaps, I should say, not realizing how dead it is. I mean, you know, we take little kids and we spend their entire lives preparing them to be successful because they have ended up learning more and more about less and less. I mean, in the present century, the brains we value are the brains that know a fantastic amount about almost nothing. I have a friend who got his doctorate in Milton's use of the comma, and he's now head of department at a major university because that sort of specialization is highly valued. The problem with it is, it seems to me, is it comes out of technology requirements, economic requirements of the past, for which these kinds of structures were very sensibly created. That is to say, to run with the ball, to take the material that was being discovered in the Industrial Revolution, or even before it in the 17th century, exploration of the planet, the new sciences around and after Galileo, and to concentrate on these new discoveries in order to maximize the benefit to society that they would provide. And to do that, you needed a kind of intellectual microscope. You needed to burrow deep into these things to find out, once you know what gravity is, you really need to find out what it does for you, what it does itself, what is it, down to the smallest detail. That's laudable, and it's entirely necessary in the past. It seems to me, I risk the wrath of every academic, but it seems to me now that taking knowledge from this academic point of view is doing society a disservice in the sense that what we need in the next hundred years, especially we in the West, with the so-called flat earth happening around us, what we need to think more and more about is how we get people to think creatively. It is no longer a sign of intelligence that a person can remember things. It should no longer be a test of intelligence whether they can give the right answer. Because the right answer, as I learned to my cost when I was at university, is very often the least creative one and the one that's likely to get you the most flack from your tutor. I mean, you know, creative thinking can often make mistakes. If you make mistakes in specialist reductionist learning, you fail. And if you don't get the degree, you are unintelligent. Well, that's self-evidently nonsense. So long harangue here. So what this kind of interdisciplinary approach to knowledge is that the knowledge web represents is an attempt to try and create some kind of infrastructure within which people can learn to think cross-disciplinarily and therefore creatively because I believe all creative thinking comes from bringing concepts and ideas and people together in new ways. And the only way you do that is to break the boundaries between the disciplines and cross them. And that, for most specialists, is scary and not to be done. Well, I'm curious. I know I didn't have this on the official question list, but there's a theory that has been proposed actually a number of years ago by Howard Gardner and others that suggests that even the brain develops in different ways if you do not expose it to other things, as you get more reductionist, to your point, that actually what really happens is that your brain cells begin to evolve and change so that you are favoring the reductionist thing that you're approaching. I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. There's a theory some time back that said, you know, the more you use a particular junction in the brain, the stronger it gets, as it were, the more layers you lay on it, so to speak, the more that becomes a kind of preferred pathway through the brain, and that any time you throw a problem at that part of the brain that is approximately of that kind, it will take that preferred route. That may be true. I don't know. I'm not a neurophysiologist. I would guess it's probably not too far from the truth. However, I think also, as Gardner postulated, the great thing about the brain is you can do that or you can do a zillion other things and all you need to do is to start again, as it were. I mean, the brain, my favorite figure, I mean, there are 100 billion neurons in the brain, each carrying up to 50,000 dendrites, each capable of linking with another 50,000 dendrites. Combinatorial, that means that the number of ways in which signal thoughts can go through the brain is larger than the numbers of atoms in the known universe. So, even if you get yourself a reduction to education and you lay down those 16 preferred pathways, there are something like a trillion others that you could be encouraged to use if it were not forced on you economically by society to stick to that last and do nothing else. I mean, I'm not sure that people have brains that force them to remain chemists. I think they are forced to remain chemists because of the way we structure our education vocationally. You become a chemist and you know, you're not going to walk into a physics lab and have anybody let you in, let alone an art studio. You're a chemist. And, you know, that defines you for the rest of your life. And that's probably why people stick to these preferred pathways, because after a while you feel safe. 
Well, you feel safe and protected, and actually, to some extent, I would agree that even in our societal constructs, that it's very easy for someone to continue to do more and more of the same for longer and longer. Taking this even a step further, the question that comes to mind is how does society in general, not just the educational system, but society, our economic structure or whatever, play a role in reinforcing this kind of reductionism? I mean, how do you see that all playing together? Well, I think I've explained in a sense how, what I think is the way in which society reinforces reductionism because it, you know, it says you're a chemist, you can't be anything else. Uh, how do we change it is what I'm interested in. How do we meet the requirement in the next hundred years to generate and to succeed in a knowledge economy, an economy where creative thinking is how you stay alive and competitive and, and innovate. And with the flat world, that becomes more and more essential. I mean, look at the Rust Belt, for example. I mean, that's a long gone example of how you can get yourself into a blind alley. Um, it seems to me that what we need to do is to start providing people with an infrastructure, whether it's this knowledge web or some other similar technique, so that it is not dangerous for a chemist to spend some time every day floating away in some other area that is officially out of bounds, like physics or biology or whatever. But there was a great American mathematician called Norbert Wiener who once said, change comes most of all from the no man's land between the disciplines. I mean, for example, you know, between X-ray crystallography and molecular biology came the realization of what DNA was and the whole field of genetics. Between gaslight in the early 19th century and chemistry came the investigation of what that gunk was that gaslight pr produced called coal tar, and out of that came the entire pharmaceutical industry. I mean, from physiology, Wiener himself developed cybernetics. That is to say, he produced a way of making uh, artillery fire at where a plane would be in the sky when the shell got there during World War II, and he started knocking them out of the sky because he found a way to link the idea of homeostatics in human physiology. You get hot, so you sweat. You get cold, so you shiver. It's the way of returning to balance. And he took that idea and wrote some fancy algorithm so that he could take the signals from incoming radar signals about these planes coming and use that imperfect stuff to work out probably where the plane would be in a minute and then fire the gun in that direction and it worked and as I say he called it cybernetics and he was a guy who said you know this stuff comes from the no man's land where you're not supposed to go and it seems to me the great thing about knowledge mapping knowledge webs whatever you want to call them is they encourage you to visit the no man's land and still get home safe at night you know leave your discipline Go out in the big, bad, dark, uh, no man's land. Look at areas in which your field and others might have things to do with each other. Think creatively. And as I say, still get home before it's dark, back to your nice, safe you know, chemistry lab, wherever it is you feel safe. And it seems to me that once people start to take those kinds of journeys on the kind of intellectual safety net which knowledge webs could be, the more they will choose to do so, and the less we will say that what we need in society are people who know things but rather people who know how to manipulate knowledge, how to bring knowledge together in new ways so as to innovate. Because it is only through staying ahead innovatively that we will be able to maintain our position and standard of living and all those other things we love, let's say in the West, vis-a-vis -vis what's going to be happening in China and India and the other so-called threat economies. Well, it almost sounds like that one other necessary condition is that people would be willing to explore those connections. And many times you find that people who have been trained in a discipline have been trained basically to look to only slightly to the side of them to actually look for ideas. They are not very skilled at the idea of taking something that seems totally out of their area and looking for how it might connect to what they're doing now to perhaps suggest a real innovation. Do you think this requires a different type of thinking skill that needs to be brought into the educational system? I think it requires a thinking skill that we are all born with. I mean, Einstein put it beautifully. He said, we're all born with magnificent brains that formal education then slowly destroys. I think we're born with this innate ability to bring things together in novel ways, and education knocks it out of us. And what I think we need to do in the classroom is to say, let's just start in a very small way. Let's say maybe you take you know, an hour every week, maybe no more than that, or an hour every day, and you get people, you encourage people to sit down in front of their knowledge webs or whatever it is they are using and get them to play games because all knowledge, all learning is playing a game. It's telling a story. And get them to invent stories about the material. The great thing, as I said earlier, is it doesn't have to be right. 
there is no such thing as right in some ways. I mean, you can try to put two things together and they won't go together. So instead of saying, that doesn't work, throwing it away, you could be encouraged to say, well, if they won't work together in the way you've done it, is there any other way in which they would work together? And so you expand across the web to find alternate ways of putting these two things together. Then if you fail, you fail. But as I said, you go home at night before it's dark. Um, so I think you have to start in a very small way, and you have to start people thinking that it is a good thing to do to think like this. Now, the real problem, and this is why, to be perfectly frank, I have had some flack from teachers who say, we're in the trenches and you're up there talking fancy nonsense, is it's terribly difficult to assess people using this mode of thinking about thinking. I mean, it's easy to say pass or fail if you say, you know, when did Newton write the Principia? Well, if you've got the date wrong, that's wrong, and you just don't pass that test. So we teach in order to pass or fail without any difficulty, as it were, in the part of the teacher. Most teaching is there to get the right answer out of the student, and this goes all the way back to the medieval period, and has changed. You know, you're either right or you're wrong. The thing about innovation is there are many, many areas where it's gray until you fiddle around a bit more with the mix, and then maybe it's not gray anymore. Maybe it's right, or maybe it, it is what you want it to be. So the problem about assessing intelligence and ability on the knowledge web, on knowledge map, is the teacher will be faced with students coming back from their experience with knowledge the teacher doesn't know and has no time to verify. And then, this is a scary question, do you start to say, are there ways of thinking about intelligence that we should start to use? Like, are there new ways of saying, intelligence is not getting things right or wrong and therefore getting a PhD or being stupid, but of saying, intelligence is exciting and innovative ways of linking things together of crossing the knowledge web, and I don't know how you assess this. For example, okay, I said earlier, one kind of intelligence tries to get to Newton from ice cream. The other kind tries to get to Newton from E equals MC squared. I would argue that if the person gets Newton from ice cream, they are innately thinking in a more creative way than the person who starts from modern physics to go back to Newton. Now, how you grade that, I don't know. Somebody else better than me will have to work that out. But it seems to me that that's the direction we have to go in. Actually, maybe as an example in my case, and I'll ask my listeners to bear with me for a minute. Back when I was studying optical engineering, back when I was working on my graduate degree, one of the things that many of us are using all the time are Maxwell's equations, which is a set of physics equations for those in the audience that don't know of them that often allow us to model the way that electromagnetic fields like electricity, light, and other things can propagate. And those are generally given to us in our engineering schools as givens. Yes, Maxwell had to come up with them, but they're givens, and you start with them, and you derive things from them. And I remember as a thought experiment, and it took me literally over a month to go through the process, and I probably even not like to get into why I did it because it wasn't for credit. It was more of an exploration. I started with a different thing, and James, I'm sure you know this well, but Fermat's principle of least time, which is that electromagnetic fields or other things tend to propagate in a path that takes the least amount of time. And and that's a loose translation. It is 30 years after I did it, so I'm forgetting. But I started with that, and then from that, it was possible, step by step by step, to end up deriving everything from Maxwell's equations all the way to the way that lenses bend light and on this principle of least time. So instead of starting with these things as given, which I would argue is more reductionist, I started with, let me just look at it from a completely different perspective. If, if the way things work is that they just naturally take the laziest path possible, might be one way to think of it, and then what would that mean? It really suggested a lot of different innovations, different ways of looking at it. So you know, maybe this is an example of a different way of thinking to help you make discoveries. Yes, I think so. I think probably in a very much smaller way, in a classroom well removed from the Augustan Heights of a postgraduate degree, but in an ordinary classroom, maybe the trick would be to say, you know, in this course we've been studying this subject. Now let's take this subject and see if we can move away from it legitimately, in the old terms, legitimately, far enough away from it to be so far away that it, it can no longer be properly described as that subject, but 
is indeed related to it and then see what you find out by doing that journey. And those micro journeys away from the subject might do no more than to teach the students to think relationally, to look outwards from any particular subject and to recognize that no subject exists in vacuo. And this is again, you know, another problem with reductionism. In my lifetime doing research for programs and books and so on, I've, I've lost count of the number of times I've spoken to some authority and said, can you tell me why so-and-so did so? And he'd say, or she'd say, that's outside my field. I have no idea, and I don't want to know about that. When, in fact, you're talking about something that was to profoundly affect that particular field at some point in history. So if all we can do at the beginning is to encourage, then maybe what we're doing is preparing people, A, yes, to have a reductionist degree, to go out there as a chemist or whatever they are, and get into a company, but thinking in this funny way at least maybe one hour a day, which maybe encourages them within their company, within their organization, to think cross-disciplinarily and possibly to be the source of innovative thinking within the corporation because there's no doubt that while a reductionist training will allow you to fill it something and make sure it, it doesn't fail, that's extremely valuable, it surely also prepares you to recognize that a new idea, a new link between that subject and something else can also be examined to see if it can be falsified. And if it can't, then you have a legitimately new innovation that has occurred. But to do that, you have to get out there into that no man's land, create the innovation, and then apply the old reduction of rules to make sure it doesn't fail, and then say, yes, I've got it, and it's called, you know, cybernetics or the carburetor or whatever it is. Some people listening might say, well, don't the search engines do this sort of thing already? When you use Google and all that, doesn't that really effectively allow you to walk the web? But I think effectively you've answered some of that by saying that, well, this is still a reductionist approach. It's, it's looking for the needle in the haystack, and we're going to get a very precisely located needle. Well, I think it's two things at once. All I was trying to say was the reductionist approach is not something we should throw away, baby with bathwater. No, no. What I'm saying is that keeping the reductionist material that we know and we're happy with, we're chemists and we're you know, in our little house full of chemists, you can take these crazy journeys out there without risking anything, knowing that if you think you come across something or you innovate in a way, you can still apply the old reductionist rules to see that it works. Obviously, you don't want to come across a marvelous new way of building a bridge if the first thing that happens when somebody stands on it is it falls down. So maybe, you know, you talk to your engineer across the gap, as it were. So there are reductionist ways of cooperating to work together on something that comes from the no man's land so that everybody involved, all the cooperative group, can put their 10 cents worth in and say, from my point of view, it's legitimate, it works. Well, with the few minutes we have remaining, maybe a couple of things to go over that I want to make sure we cover. One of them is, what is the state of the Knowledge Web project, and how far along is it? The state of the Knowledge Web project is somewhere between great and lamentable. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's taken about five years to get the materials ready. There are about 2,500,000 words of biography and general data, which is what, the equivalent to 25 books. So it's taken some time for me to do that. Um, we are about to, I hope, close a deal with a software house to use a particular kind of software as the skeleton for the web. I've been using it because I licensed it personally for some years to build this thing. And now with a bit of luck, we'll get their permission to use it to allow other people to use it to work it. What's missing is the interface. I've written specs for the interface. It's very ambitious. It's a little bit, I don't know if any of your listeners ever saw a film called Sphere, where they go into the spacecraft and there are no controls until you put your hand up in the air and then they appear, rather sort of like a filmy thing in the air, and you touch it. And, and somewhere between there and what was that movie with Tom Cruise as a detective in the future? Minority Report. Minority Report, where they juggled around with that stuff. So somewhere in that area. And it's, it's obviously ambitious because to get anybody under 20 interested in any of this stuff, it really has to be bells and whistles. So the bells and whistles are what's missing. And alas, the bells and whistles are either what need lots and lots of help for this nonprofit event or lots and lots of money for the same reason, to get it built. So if I could make an appeal to anybody out there who has these kinds of skills and who'd like to help, we'd love them to come and help because it's a complicated problem which I am incapable of solving and most of the guys I'm working with are too because it really needs very high level skills which need to be in some form or other donated and that isn't easy to find in this modern world. <laughs> No, that's true. Well, hopefully with the reach that we have had with these podcasts in the past, hopefully we'll find someone now that then gets to the next point. 
if someone here hears this and either knows somebody themselves or is that somebody, how might they get in touch with you to learn more and either in the form of donations of time, donations of money or whatever, how could they reach you? Thank you. Let me emphasize that it's really time. That's much more important. I mean, none of us is in this for profit. We're all doing it as volunteers. So, you know, there's always a way of getting something done without having to spend any money. So if we can do that, that's great. But of course, money is useful uh, eventually for something. I'm sure we'll think of it. <laughs> anyway, to get hold of me, my email address, burkeuk at aol.com, B-U-R-K-E-U-K, all one word, at aol.com, or the, the K-Web website, which has some more stuff on there about what we're up to, and that's k-web.org. We'll actually put those links on our website here at Stranova so you can take a look for them. And maybe as a closing statement here, is there anything else, considering that we're talking to people that are managing strategic innovation in business around the world, is there any other message you might want to pass on to them? I guess, you know, who am I to pass on messages to the captains of industry? But in the knowledge economy, you either think innovatively, you take risks for using these kinds of infrastructures, or you're dead. So I very much hope that I'm preaching to the choir already. Well, hopefully you guys aren't dead out there that are listening to this. I <laughs> appreciate it very much. And I would encourage all of our listeners definitely to get in touch with James. He's been working in this realm for a very long time, over 30 years, and the Knowledge Web Project really leverages all the things we've had before. And actually, in the line of, I believe it was Newton, we are standing on the shoulders of giants in the process of making this happen. So, James, I thank you for making that possible, and joining us this week on Stranova. I enjoyed it tremendously, especially realizing that you yourself, this Stranova is the 21st century. This is where we go next. So it's been a great pleasure for me to be on it and be part of it. Well, thank you very much, James. So, as a follow-up to one of my last comments to our guests this week, I am hoping you are not only not dead out there, but in fact right now rather fired up, as we say here in the United States, about a couple of things we don't think enough about in our world today. One of the critical things I'm hoping you're considering right now is that, for all the value specialists do hold in our business and technology worlds today, much of the innovation they bring to the world is more evolutionary in nature. And if that's the place you're expecting revolutionary innovation to occur, you may be waiting a very long time. And even if these specialists do uncover something dramatic and new, it will more likely have come from an accidental discovery or someone dabbling in a crossover realm outside of their discipline than from something directly in their regular specialist path. Second, I'm hoping you're also now thinking hard about how you may need to remake the learning paths within your own organization, as well as how you invest in innovation itself to encourage the breakthroughs that come from exploring the interconnections between seemingly unrelated disciplines, and from investing in the brilliant generalists who are selected less for the collection of raw facts they know than for their ability to draw connections and insight from previously unconnected worlds or disciplines. We said it before in these series that the most exciting source of innovation is at the edges of business ecosystems, where seemingly unrelated areas collide and new concepts sprout up virtually everywhere. But as you traveled along with the thoughts James Burke brought us this episode, traveling in your mind along the paths of the knowledge web, I'm hoping the concept was driven home even more strikingly this time. As to the knowledge web itself, I'm also hoping you listeners out there that may be able to help with time, particularly in the development of the graphics user interface, or GUI, on the knowledge web, or money, or both, are excited about what Mr. Burke has created and are willing to put your brains, time, and bank accounts to work to bring this incredible vision to reality. I've seen the private showings of how this works so far, and I can assure you the impact of setting the public version of it out there will be, indeed, world transforming. As we close this episode, then, I challenge all of you to harness that fired-up energy you feel right now to, one, find a way to support the creation of the Knowledge Web Project, and two, to make some dramatic changes in the way you manage and influence innovation in your own organization. The second will make a big difference to your business's long-term strategic growth, and the first is going to make an even more important difference to the way we learn and the innovations our children will bring to light for generations to come. That's our show for this week, and thanks for listening. 
We thank you for joining us for this episode of Stranova's podcast series. If you'd like to learn more about Stranova's business services and the topics discussed in this week's episode, please visit us at www.stranova.com, write us at ideas at stranova.com, or visit our blog at blog.stranova.com. Our program materials are covered by a Creative Commons license, the Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivatives 2.5 license by Brad Redderson. And this is Brad Redderson inviting you to join us soon for a future audio program exploring where strategy and innovation intersect.